You're welcome back. It's time now to x-ray some of the headlines on our national dailies. We're taking three newspapers today, The Guardian, uh, The Punch, and The Nation newspaper. Those are the newspapers we're going to be looking at. You might want to have a copy if you don't have all. You know, go to the internet and find out what the headlines are. But in the meantime, we're going to do justice to the headlines, or at least some of them, if we cannot cover everything. Uh, to help us do that, we have architect uh, Ezekiel Nyaitok, a public affairs analyst, uh, talking to us from Aquarium. Good morning and welcome to the show, uh, architect. Thanks for having me. Lots of happy hours to you from Aquaibom. <laughs> it's always happy hour from Aquaibom. I hope that it is sustained for four years. Mm. I'm sure it will be. Amen to that. Okay. Uh, now, let's begin. It's a very interesting thing that we're beginning today with something that really concerns you. High prices push government homes beyond average Nigerians' reach. Um, that's uh, the the biggest headline there on the guardian let me just go ahead and take some of them and then we'll start with that one uh, we have sciid guarantee how not to investigate deter criminals and all that um federal government directs cbn to settle foreign airlines backlog six years after nigeria awards 49 gas flare sites to 42 investors then Kanu suspends another cast co-director for alleged palliative diversion. Uh, federal government moves NIMC to Ministry of Interior as issued NINs hit 102.4 million. So let's begin with government homes. High prices push government homes beyond average Nigerians' reach. Let's get your comments on that. You have insight into this. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy that a major paper is making housing a major headline. You know, in every economy, this is what I've been on for over 30 years, advocating for housing, specifically social housing as social infrastructure. A lot of times we do not know that housing is not just, you know, one of those things. It is actually foundational. If you look at the Maslow's pyramid of human needs, food, clothing, and shelter, it's one of the basics, it's one of the fundamentals. Housing has so much impact on national economy, job creation. One housing is one of the areas that creates most jobs. You know, think of one house you want to build. You are going to engage a minimum of 30 sets of people and in different fields, the carpenters are different from the masons, they are different from the iron benders, they are different from the plumbers, they are different from the electricians, they are different from, you know, and then you have the labor, even within the carpentry, those that do doors like the furniture sets are different from those that do other parts. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And imagine government investing. Another good thing about housing is that now you talk about the extension workers and others, you talk about the suppliers of cement, of sand, of gravel, or granite, of all sorts of things. And over 90%, 95% of the money goes local. So any state government that wants to do road, you realize that about 80% goes outside, like capital flights. You know, the, the asphalt is not from you, all the other uh, elements, even the the, 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 the work the, the workforce, you know, you only have labor while the top money goes top. So the labor content probably takes less than 15% of the resources. But that same man who wants to do road for 10 billion might realize that just about one or two billion gets down, you know, to the to, to the people. But a man who wants to do housing for 10 billion almost the whole of the 10 billion gets into the local economy now when you leave that part and come to understand government and housing i had you no know, sectionalized or categorized housing or segmented housing into three areas and these three areas have been adopted i would say internationally you have what you call what i call the luxury homes or luxury housing you have affordable housing you have social housing they are different. They are not the same thing. Affordable homes or affordable housing, uh, luxury housing, uh, so uh, affordable housing and social housing, those three. Now, when you come to, you know, luxury homes, 
you are putting in place systems and structures that will allow the rich man to enjoy his wealth. You must allow that. But what you do is you tax, you get money from that. Now, in the second segment, that is in luxury housing, in the second segment, which is affordable housing, affordable housing and mass housing is usually, you know, kind of mixed up. Mass housing can be luxury housing, it be, though hardly so. Mass housing can be affordable housing. Mass housing just means production of the housing in large quantities. It could be any of these segmentations. But when you come to luxury housing, I've talked about it for the rich, you tax them. Affordable housing, which is where the organized private sector plays, you make it easier for them, like Mr. Wicker said, don't come and collect land at 5 million and speculate and sell it for 50 million because the developer that buys the land at 50 million has 50 million as the base where he's going to be able to use to peg the price of the house. Because, I mean, I could have a full lecture of three hours and it will not be enough. Because in pegging the price of the house, you talk of cost of land, you talk of cost of funds, you talk of cost of materials, you talk of your, you know, the, your, your overheads, you know. So cost of land is usually a major component if my cost of land to start with is 50 million because i, I get this second hand now when i add uh, the other cost i'm going to be selling that house is about maybe about a hundred million but if i got it direct and the cost of land was just five million i have knocked off 45 million so that house becomes much more affordable but the most important part is the social housing Social housing is the exclusive responsibility of the government, which must be considered as social infrastructure, where government must, as a, as a right, as a necessity, as an obligation, you know, make housing available as stated in the housing policy of Nigeria, where I was privileged to be the vice chairman of that committee that birthed that housing policy. The wandering psychopath or the madman is entitled to housing, to shelter, to accommodation. So social housing is the prime responsibility of government that must be taken as social infrastructure. Luckily, the current minister of housing is a very, very close friend. And then um, some days back, we spent probably up to two hours looking at these issues, and he made a particular striking statement. He said that the current president has the, 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 the what's the word? The political will. I like that. He has the political will to address the issue of housing. And then some days back, you heard even the vice president talking a lot about housing. So housing, and today you have a major paper taking housing as a major headline. So we're starting to come to terms with certain realities. And these realities are what will help this government. Because if this, think about it, the last time you heard about housing was when Shagari housing. Mm. Imagine, just think about it. And then in Lagos, you had Jaconde housing. So subsequent, you know, governments have neglected housing. So we now have housing deficit at Several figures thrown out, 30 million, 25 million, 17 million. Luckily, again, we are having the sensors that we're going to have. Housing is one of the major components of that housing. So I, I want to really plead with uh, Nigerians that, you know, there's a way government works. Government works on lines of least resistance. They apply themselves to what people talk about and want to be heard. That's why in the housing policy, it was written that the cries of the people woke up government. That's the expression that was used, woke up government. So let the professionals in the industry talk about it. Let the average Nigerian who is feeling the pains of the high cost of housing be an advocate, write about it, talk about it. Don't only leave it for Nyaito who comes and shouts himself house and i mean november 1 i'll be 60 so some some of us are on the retirement lane and we need to hand over to younger people that's why a guy like i can and I'm, I'm happy to mention a young guy like adebayo who does the housing show in he does a one-man riot squad and he's doing well let others come in 
Let the media talk about it. Let them, like you've done today, giving a major segment to housing. Let others join what Plus TV Africa has just done. What I think is the Guardian did. No, no, I think it was, um, it wasn't the, the Guardian. Guardian. The Guardian, the Guardian. The Guardian. Oh, it was the Guardian. Awesome, awesome. So let us make housing a major national issue and then government will find that 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 synergy you know to know that he's doing something no politician wants to invest where the people are not interested but when they realize that the people are really interested in housing they are going to devote themselves to it devote the resources to it and one of the br brilliant things they've done two things one to create bring back that ministry of housing when it was worked and housing it was a poor bride of a man that did not even have any interest everything was about works but now you have housing and not just housing we have round peg in a round hole bringing somebody who is a major player in that industry the former md of federal mortgage bank to be the minister of housing so he understands the game plan you don't need to start to explain things to him as we we're talking it was like you know like poles were just attracting you know I think I'm using a wrong word because I think it's unlike those that attract. But it was like, you know, two can play. Two cannot work together except they be agreed. That's what the Bible says. So we were agreeing and the ideas he has, the energy he has, the drive that he has, coupled with the political will of Mr. President, I know that housing is going to be a major agenda and certain fundamental issues are going to be addressed. Uh, let me not sound like a, a pessimist, but I do hope that... Um, because we have seen a lot of uh, good people gone bad when they join politics, when they are in uh, that foray there. And um, uh, let's be, let me also hope that this political will that the Mr. President has developed now uh, is going to really work out. Because in Lagos, I doubt if that housing was taken seriously when he was at the helm of affairs uh, in Lagos State. A lot of other things were done, but housing, I'm not too sure about that. But... Um, uh, if he has the political will, it's a very I, I, good I'll thing. Tell you, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this about um, President Tinubu. He's, he's, um, he's at the risk of being misunderstood. He's a sucker for deals. He's a deals man. He puts his money where he is. He puts his mouth where his money is. So in Lagos, he has his priorities. In Nigeria, he's trying to establish his priorities. Okay. okay? So he, he, he hits where he knows he can break. So that's why we are making, and you know, the minister, if he was not somebody who was interested, would not send for me. There are many people that would not touch me with a 10 foot pole because I am bad market for them. They know why. Those who want to do deals, they don't go near Nyaito. But once you call Nyaito, it means you are looking for results, you are looking for how to get it done. And for him to send for me for us to have that spend time, it means that he's not somebody that's a minister this time. He's not somebody who is looking for deals, but somebody who is looking for results. Yeah, but Only okay. Now, uh, so, sorry. Um, the concern is wh why, in the first place, should um, uh, government homes be be such that people cannot reach anymore? Because you talked about one of the problems that housing has, which is uh, land. Now, the land use acts practically gives federal government free land, no matter how we see it, but they will not acquire the land as uh, at a price that an, uh, a private individual will acquire the land. So what is that thing that really makes federal government not to, apart from the fact that people are not crying, but, but, but what, what is it that will make government homes so expensive that the people cannot reach anymore? I've said this time and time and time again, and the day Nigeria and Nigerians listen to me, there will be a marked turning point. We are always expecting a dog to meow or a cat to bark, and it will not happen. What do I mean by that? During election, you collect money from these people. You don't interrogate who they are. They sell their souls and their conscience to buy your vote. We, we collect this money. We pretend we don't know. It's like something happens to me or to us. 
And then when these people have gotten the mandate, so to speak, and get to office, we expect them to serve you. Who is that man that will pay you to serve you? It will not happen. Over 90% of the people that are in authority or in power today, those who won election, they sold their houses, they sold their conscience, they mortgaged their, 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 it's like they used their blood to get, tell me when, which governor did not spend billions of naira. I contested the last election, and I will tell you for free that I sold five of my houses. And not everybody thinks the way I do. And there are certain lines I told myself I will not cross. I could do that, I can afford. But assuming that I had mortgaged those and I hope to get that and then become a governor, what do you think happens? You think of how to rec rec recoup and then pay back. That's it. So when the governor comes in, this is the nexus. His first thought and mindset is, where will I make money? And within that context, the Land Use Act comes in handy. Governors get in there, almost all of them. I don't want to use the same brush to paint everybody because if I had won the election or if I had been declared the winner, I would also be a governor. So I believe that there are one, two, three that mean well, that could have done what I had in mind to do, or I still have in mind to you know, we know we are still in the tribunal, mm -hmm. so it never finished. Anyway, <laughs> but on a serious note, to them, the Land Use Act is power and not service. Service means who can get this um, title to bring in industries and do this and do that, who can make land available, who can come and build. I'm going to set up land and infrastructure. Can you come and build? How much are you going to deliver from? Remove the cost. I give you land for free. So the house of 20 million can come down to... 12 million or the house of 12 million can come down to 6 million and be more affordable that is service to the people no the governors are oh boy come and take this land and sell it so you are locate the land for 5 million they sell it for 50 million you are just an agent of the system the governors are you didn't support me so that your land i'm not going to give you c or four on it so that industry you wanted to do, you can no longer do it because the money, the land title is not there. And without land title, which is foundational, you cannot get funding. And you cannot get funding, you cannot do business. So they don't think that way. They think in terms of power. They think in terms of uh, 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 retaliating. They think of being vindictive. They think of using it to subjugate you and bring you down to a level where you must support them by fire, by force. So this mindset have to do with the person and how the person got there. So if you don't interrogate that, which is the work of the office of the citizen, if you don't do that, the moment the guy takes the mandate from you, oh boy, just four years, keep quiet and relax and let the man enjoy. It's like you, are, you build a house. You have a, a right to keep that house for yourself. But then you lease that house to a tenant. You draw up an agreement. The tenant pays you. Okay? You can't be going to enter the man's bedroom and say it's my house. No, you've got to allow him peaceful occupation of that space within the period for which he has paid you your rent. And then when it expires, you decide whether you want to renew and what terms you want to renew. Okay? Now, if you tell the man, you know what, take this house for free, don't pay me a dime, but I can come in any time and I inspect, I can enter any time, or pay me this amount, it is yours. Now, if that house is for free and you can come in any time and that is the agreement, you can do that. People come to you and say, we want to be the governor of the state. And you say, mobilize me, pay me, settle me, vote by when the man said all that to you the understanding is that you don't collect your four years now so just park and wait but if you say if nigerians if the office of the citizen can come and say we want to know what you want to do we want to see your game plan mr a mr b mr c and then they forget this mentality of big party small party parties don't run a government human beings do so all this obsession with the big parties is is something that we're not thinking
You understand me? Mm. Somebody from a small party can be the best driver. You need a driver. Somebody from the smallest party can be a big driver. Once you acknowledge that, and everybody cues behind that person, he automatically becomes a big person. That's what happened in Labour Party movement. There was Labour Party that was neither there here nor there, or NNPP that was neither here nor there. It was the answer me. Then Mr. Kwam Kwaso came in, energized that system. Mr. Peter Obi came in, energized that system. So what we need is, going forward, us profiling and interrogating persons and then queuing up behind those persons. When we do that, then the parties, big parties, will sit up, knowing there is no longer a birthright. And when they sit up, they will address your issues and problems. Okay. We've done enough on this housing. Uh, I know that we can still talk more about them, but um, let's move on to another issue still on the Guardian newspaper. And it, it's a very small headline there. Kanu suspends another CASCO director for alleged palliative diversion. And then the question that never gets old, are we not making a mistake with these palliatives? Is it not just naming uh, the same thing uh, with something different? You know, I have always from day one. You know, government is foundational. We have people that get into government and have no understanding of what government is. And it, it, it aches my heart. We have... If you look at chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2B of our constitution, it gives what is the matching order. It says that the security and the welfare of the people shall, in legal palace, incidentally, yesterday I was in a dock for the first time in my life, you know, maybe uh, in November when I'll be 60, but for the first time in my whole life, I was there in the dock and I had 11 people, parties, whatever, bombing almost a total of about 30, you know, lawyers descending on me for almost three hours. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and God, did I see the mercy and the grace of God. <laughs> no, coming back to where we were. Now, the security in legal palace shall is more, is stronger than must. So when they say the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. So anybody that is going to go into government, you know, that must get into government. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good, thank you. Is that person must understand that it's about service to the people. How do we relate it to palliative? Now, if you know that it is about service to the people, you will think in terms of what you will do that is sustainable and in the interest of the people. What we are doing, this thing called palliative, another word for palliative to me is politics. How will I, as a private sector person, go to that point of carrying 20 billion to buy food for people to eat in one week and it is finished. It doesn't make sense to me as a private sector person. It doesn't. Hmm. It doesn't make sense to me as a private sector person. It just doesn't. I would rather have carried that 20 billion, segmented into five, 500,000 naira, profile young people, and giving this money to them for them to start small businesses after I have trained them. I would rather do that. And this 500,000 that have trained the people and given the monies to them, they are going to, number one, employ people. Number two, they are going to generate, you know, um, um, produce and products. They are going to stimulate the economy. So my five, my 20 billion is a seed that I've sown that is going to grow. That 
is a mindset that makes sense to me. Now, extrapolate that, assuming the governor of Akwaibom State did what I did, and the governor of another state, I don't know which state to call, just call another state, do you understand me, <laughs> gave the palliatives. Fast forward one year after. Those who were collecting this palliative, and within two weeks they finished eating, they are, cannot have it again. They are angry. Do you understand me? Why do you put sugar in my, you know, I drink my gari with salt. And I'm happy. You now come and gave me sugar. And you change my taste bud from salt to sugar. Just when I'm starting to enjoy the sugar, you say you don't finish. Go back to salt. You've created a problem for me. But if you allowed me to now be eating my salt, and then you give me something to do, and from what I do, I can now buy sugar. Because it's from my sweat, even the way I use that sugar, I'll be taking one cube of sugar, cutting in two, and managing it until when I can now use one full cube of sugar. But when it is free sugar, you find the person carrying five cubes, putting in one bowl of gari, and at the end of the day, probably developing diabetes. So what have you done? You have created a dependency syndrome on this person, and like a fish duped out of the deep, you have left the person, you know, hanging, and it leads to frustration, it can lead to drug, it can lead to all manner of vices, you know. So you've not done well. That's not thinking in governance. So now, whereas that of an acquired person would have now started to build his business, employ people, and how many years down the line that person is having a flourishing business because you invested the so-called palliative funds instead of eating that palliative funds. So that is where I want to rest my case. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> we'll move to another thing. Uh, we'll go to the Punch newspaper now. And there is a headline there, ASU parents protest as more universities hike fees. Um, the federal government was talking like, you know, it's going to be easy. Then we will have loans. We will have these and that. This is September already. And they said loans will start, you know, uh, being uh, given to the people or the students or, to make sure that they can still continue to go to school. Now, universities are just hiking their fees. You'll hear this one here, the other one there. Some of them are... Uh, taking their fees as high as 100% more, some of them as high as 200 or even 300%. There's a school we were talking about yesterday that had fees as low as 19,000. Now that same school is paying 89,200 for the same uh, course that they were paying 19,000 for. Uh, somebody who did not plan for this, uh, whose salary has not increased, whose livelihood has not become better, how can he even pay? So. I don't know what is really going on. Parents are protesting and even the students are protesting. I remember yesterday uh, we were carrying a story about how the uh, security forces mobilized and went to Unilag because uh, in Unilag the, the, the school fees have gone up and all that. I don't know what your comments will be. What will be the, the solution to this kind of thing? What is really happening? Can our educational system survive it? You see, if I was to write an application, which I've never done in my life, if I was to write an application, it would be to be the DG of the National Orientation Agency. Or one other one that I will not say, but it's not a minister. No, 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 not any of those things. There's something about housing that I like, okay? <laughs> but if I was to write an application, it is for that of the DG of National Orientation Agency. And if Mr. President is to make success and not politics of Nigeria, it should be the minister, or that, that agency should re report directly to the presidency. He should personally oversee national orientation because there is a disconnect between government and the people because of the amount of lies that government have told us over the years. So the people don't believe government. And you need the people to succeed in any government. You need the people. Why am I bringing this in? 
if you look at the universities now when you are protesting why are you protesting you are protesting because you think they should not do that why should they not do that it is because you cannot afford that is on one hand on the other hand why are the people raising the funds because the arguments will be taken from two sides mm. the protesters and then the institution i've told you why the protesters are protesting they cannot afford and we understand why they cannot afford everything is going south now why are the institutions raising their funds because all prices have gone up they need to maintain the infrastructure they need to pay the people they need to bring a new set of um, you know paradigms and parameters and things to improve the learning you know process they need money they do not have money and costs are high they need money so how do they get money they get money either by hiking the fees or getting subsidy from government because they can only get money from subsidy from government or hiking fees now do they have money from government no because government does not have money again money government wants subsidy on electricity they we want the subsidy on petrol we want subsidy on housing we want subsidy. do they have look we have needs of five hundred thousand. but what is available in the purse is fifty thousand. The question is, can we let the people know honestly and sincerely that it's only 50,000 we have and that the need is 500,000 and that it cannot go and that we need to come down to make certain sacrifices? We now start with ourselves. Yesterday, I saw the president come down, you know, return, I think yesterday or two days back, and I just, I think there were less than 20 people that were there to receive him. And I'm like, oh Lord, thank God. It seems this uh, president is starting to listen. Because in the past, you'll be waiting for 30 minutes for the convoy to pass. Well, well wishers, you know, psychophants, all sorts of people. And the time has gone with Mr. President to say, I don't want that again. It's enough. Don't come to me. We have no business that breathes. So that you see a president passing with a convoy of about 20 cars and all those hangers on are not following him why are you following me following me for what don't do that again i don't want that so when he starts by himself showing that example the national assembly follows suit and you see people cutting down costs then you now start to have parents who now the national orientation will now let you see that having university education is not necessarily having better life why do i say so one of the places i like to go and buy shawarma in uyo it's done by a graduate who spent four years and the resources of his parents doing what was absolutely unnecessary because by the time he finished secondary school he had this passion for you know that kind of trade he could easily have gone to a catering school where in less than six to nine months or one year maximum he would have you know graduated and started the business but he went to four years in school after four years of excruciating pain he came back to go to and do six months in a catering school to do what he's doing now there's need to orientate the minds of nigerians that this so-called university education that our parents say we must we must have you can do what you are doing and then be doing extension classes or you'll be doing you know um uh, uh, offline university there's, there's a way it's called you know or you will even be taking courses while you are doing your business online it's available now you can get certification so there's need for a certain national reorientation because the pressure on parents to get university education when you come back and you achieve nothing there's need for a national policy to educate nigerians that this university you don't really need it like that though. and if you need it this is the implication and this is how it's got to do and this, the next thing is sending children abroad. He 
if you know what parents are going through, you will hate your life. And I, but, I, I, well, I, I, my, I, my, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's because some of these things are happening, and then um, you turn around and see: Is it really? Um, am I really the one who is supposed to do the sacrifice? Like you said, you, the president has to start with himself and maybe with his cabinet and everybody else. Uh, but in a situation where you find uh, these people who are asking you to do the sacrifice, not sacrificing anything, they're taking even more uh, from... Uh, right now, labor, yesterday it was on the headlines, that labor is threatening to go on that very murder of all strikes, as they, as they call it, murder of all strikes. One of the reasons is that they said it's an insult to now gather like six families and give them one bag of rice when a legislator, one legislator is taking about a hundred million. So why should the people be the ones to sacrifice for a few people to just feed fat? That's why it is going to be very difficult to do that work as uh, the uh, managing director of uh, national orientation if you were given that position. So what would you really tell you, them? You are, you are so right because it is one reason they will not want me there. Because if you are the DG of national orientation, you've got to be like the law lady. Your eyes are going to be blinded. Do you understand me? What the Bible says that wisdom is profitable to direct. Yes, wisdom will direct you, but you are going to have to do the loud one outside and you must of necessity do the quiet one inside. What is the quiet one inside? You must let Mr. President know the fact, but you're not going to do that on the pages of the newspaper or on Ch Plus TV Africa. No, you're not going to do that because there is a law that says you do not demystify leadership. But you are going to have to do it inside. You've got to let them know. You have to have that interface with government people who are not doing the right thing. And you tell them the right thing. And a day comes if they are adamant and they will not do it. You tell Mr. President, Mr. President, I came here to be successful for your government. And right now, I'm not being successful, honestly and sincerely, because I'm not given, you've not given me that political backing. Let me tell you what El Rufai did, my brother, my friend. He wanted to demolish houses. You know what he did? He went to OBJ, then president, and said, okay, this is what I want to do because we need to sanitize Abuja. The president said, do it. He said, sir, there will be consequences. President said, do it. He said, sir, let me give you an instance. The chairman of our party, his house, no day deployed the right place. Sir, the general, this general, this other people, their houses, it will go down. No. President said, go ahead. He said, sir, when it goes down, the Wahala will come from you to fire me, to put, sir, should I go? The president said, go, bam, 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 dim. He brought down the house of the, you know, chairman of the of PDP then. Went on this general. Wait, by the time he brought down three houses, Nigeria was on fire. And of course, expectedly, the pressure came in torrents. Papa Sanjordi, you know Baba now? Baba do like, say, hey, where the apple? He said, they brought down, they said, where, where, where you build the house? He said, hey, they, they say, hey, they die pipeline, you know what make me, you want make it. Do you understand me? What am I trying to say? He gave El Rufai the impetus. And if El Rufai could bring down the house of the chairman of PDP, by the time that the tractors are starting to rev their engine, all those Maxaka, Mama, Baba, Kwakwakwalada, all those man, one man village, all those shanties, they take off, they say, that man, that man, man, no. That is the thing that Wike is trying to do now. And so long as he has the political will of the leader, he'll be able to execute his agenda. What am I trying to bring out? Whoever is the national, the DG national orientation, he should sit down with Mr. President and not be a psychophant. Hey, you know, this is our party. No, it's a national assignment, sir, sir. How far do I go? This are my game plan. This is the way to get about it. For us to be seen as being serious because... You see, Nigerians don't trust you. So I'm going to start from in-house. In you know, I will not make it public, but I'm going to show in-house as an example of what good behavior is going on and tell others to follow suit. And Mr. President says, go ahead. And I'll come inside. I'll tell you, guy, what you are doing is not okay. So you need to change it. If not, so you go public. 
And then you go public and the president says, what? Is that what they did? He will fire one person. By the time he fires two people, when I come to your place and tell you this is not right, you will do right. And then I'll now tell Nigerians, this is the way to go. You will succeed. But if you don't have the political will of Mr. President and you want to do it, bros, forget it. It's not go work. Yeah, after the show, someone will call you and say you were not sounding Nigerian. <laughs> because there are, there are not many people who will dare to do that, which is uh, something that should be done normally, but there are not people who would dare do that because uh, uh, when you have sickle fans, it's because there are people who are ready to listen. It's like when you have a fraudster, you know, someone telling you that if you, if you give me a million naira, the next morning I'm going to give you 50 million naira. You, it will take someone to believe you before the fraud can go on. So you have sickle fans on one hand, you have people who uh, want their egos to be massaged on the other hand. And so the circle goes on and on and on and on. But right now... You, you know, let, <laughs> yeah. just, let me just chip in very, very briefly. Our leaders don't know Nigerians, unfortunately. Nigerians are the most trusting and most believing of people. Nigerians are the easiest people to preside over if you know them. Or maybe they know Nigerians too them. well. Because they know that they are going to give you, they are going to take, for instance, fuel subsidy that touches the lives yeah. of everybody, including those people that do yeah. not travel, and then yeah. give you rice, which in some states now we are hearing that you have to have PVC before you get the rice. Some people might yeah. decide not to, to vote. I'm not sure that at this point point is a crime in Nigeria if that if you don't vote you're going to jail so why are they not entitled to these palliatives for instance you're asking them do to you know bring why I'll be quiet on that do you know why I'll be quiet on that hmm. it's not a crime but I'm of the opinion that it is a civil responsibility that if you are not willing to oh, to take part in you should leave the country what about the people who cannot even vote because they are not up to age? There are some people who are orphaned at no, the no, age no, of no, 17. No. If you are below age, no, 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 no. You can be smart by her by sending your children. You can't, you understand me? But if you as an adult choose not to embark on leadership recruitment process, which is voting, then you are one of the problems of this country. But I'm sure that is not where you were going. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's not it. But so if people elect to be neutral for whatever reason is, reason is it, for it is rather, uh, for as long as it's not a crime, that you are entitled also to the enjoyment of the people of that vicinity. If you make a road, for instance, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you do. You can pass through that road. Uh, but like I always say, palliatives and then fuel subsidy removal for me is like, you know, you destroyed the bridge and then you are buying boats for people to, to ferry across a river that everybody could have just either elected to uh, trek across it or use a car or a bicycle or anything. Then you are now buying boats and then you are taking five people at a time, uh, two people at a time, ten people at a time. For me, it doesn't make sense. So in some states, I will mention the name Imo State, uh, the opposition party came out to say that they are opposing what the governor, uh, Hope Uzodema, is saying, that you don't, if you don't have PVC, you cannot be entitled to the whatever palliative, maybe it is rice or indomie or something that they're giving to the people. So what about the people who tried, honestly, to get PVCs and could not get? They will starve to death. What about the people who are just coming back into the country way, who may not have been here when the PVCs have been taken? Uh, because right now it is not a continuous process. They will starve to death and all these kind of things. And then we heard also yesterday on the news where people were saying that, okay, they are contributing, they are trying to support the federal government, and they are a group in support of the presidency and some members of the APC. So they got some palliatives as well, rice, which is palliative now. But if we talk palliatives, is rice nowadays. And they said, anytime they are uh, distributing these things, the party, party chairman must be around. Even though members of the committee are on ground, they cannot share if the party chairman in that locality is not around. It tells you that possibly party members are going to be considered first, no matter how indigent people who are not part of that party are. So it's a problem that I cannot wrap my head around, and we're talking right now. But please, let's just yeah. let's leave that now and go to the Nation newspaper briefly now because our time is running out. 
Employers yeah. reject NLC's plan to shut down economy. Remember that NLC is threatening that it will go on strike for various reasons. Reasons that will benefit their members and also reasons that will benefit the Nigerian people. Now employers are rejecting NLC's plan to shut down the economy. There's, there's that dichotomy. There's that separation. There is that um, division within NLC and NLC seems to be the only opposition, even though people do not um, trust them that much nowadays, but they seem to be the only opposition voice or the voice of the people when they are talking and interacting with government. Now there are these divisions. Does it not bother you? Yeah, it, it does bother me, but uh, in terms of, I think there are two, um, two sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. Now, there is the NLC, there's employers, there's employees. Mm. No employer will be happy that the economy is shut down. I'm an employer. And you see, I'm not going to be able to tell my staff, when you don't work, I will not pay you. I won't be able to tell them that. But how am I going to pay you when I don't have the money? How do I have money when you are not working? So it is, um, if employers are concerned, I think it's only natural and should be expected. On the other hand, I am an active part of NLC. And I think that government should come clean on some of these matters. Because there's too much of, uh, you know, opaqueness, you know. Uh, there's lack of transparency. And, you know, this fight that you are having, Labour says, you give one bag of rice to 12 families. What they didn't add was for six months... Mm. In fact, for eternity. Okay, because there's no, there's nothing that shows that palliatives will come every six months. Mm. You understand me? But what they are saying is that for these six months, you know, so you are giving a bag of rice to 12 families to eat for eternity. It doesn't make sense. Now, I could understand if government does not have money. But this speculation that the National Assembly is getting so much money what is so difficult on coming clean on some of these matters? No, no, it's not 100 million. Right. No, no, it's 50. <laughs> there could be exaggeration, but the question is exactly how much is it? So okay. I, I understand the, the sentiments expressed. Okay, well, I would like to thank you, uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaito, for coming on the program today. We've, we've had a marathon one this morning. I would like to say thank you to you for being a part of the show. I appreciate it. God bless you. Thanks so much. You too. As I rush back to my tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Good luck. <laughs> Would like to come and have that uh, happy hour with you uh, in Aquaibo. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaito, public affairs analyst. He was talking with us from Uyo, Akwaibom State. And uh, we will take a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at your cardiovascular health as it is. So just stay with us.